So my talk tonight is about the relationship of power inequality and the kind of um, misinformation and division we've ex been experiencing here in our country. So basically, I'm going to start with a little introduction about you know, how I see this crisis in democracy. When we first had our forum, I think it was Barb Pierce said, are there problems that exist across all democracies? And there's actually um, a very textbook answer to that, which is the greatest dangers to democracy are factionalism and demagoguery. And the framers of the US Constitution had this utmost in their mind when they were framing the Constitution, how to save the democracy from the dangers that there will be factions among the leader class and that they will come to, to some kind of terrible crisis and delegitimize each other and throw the whole government into chaos. And in fact, this cartoon over here is from 1798. In fact, factionalism very quickly evolved between the Federalists who were um, labeled as the elitists or the aristocrat party and the, uh, the Democratic Republicans led by Thomas Jefferson who were labeled by the Federalists as the sort of demagogic popularists. So um, that's what these cartoons are from. That's what the concern was. But actually, the, the greatest danger, I think, is, you know, and maybe this is being influenced by the last century, is the rise of totalitarianism. And totalitarianism does not usually arise from the, the expansion of a legitimate central government into more and more areas of operation usually totalitarianism arises because there is a faction that gains control of the apparatus of the entire state for its own purposes. And often that party is led by a very demagogic figure. And that was the case both in the Hitler's Germany and in Stalinist Russia. So that sort of brings us to our present crisis of American democracy. And I think we're all aware of the way pundits talk about this as being a case in which we are living in two Americas, in which whether you're Democrat or whether you're Republican, you are experiencing a completely different world. And they also talk about the way in which the Republican Party has become the party of Trump because we've had these popular insurrections based on loyalty to his own promises, falsehoods, and fictions. Obviously, starting with the Stop the Steal movement that was begun before the election leading up to the insurrection, we're seeing the ousting of leaders who will not you know, bend to those falsehoods. But I think my point is that Trump is not the creator of this party machine, but he's the creature of it. I think that the Republican Party has largely been taken over by a machine that's been constructed by ultra rich far right conservatives. And these men have been working over the past 50 years using enormous resources and building up a sphere of knowledge that supports their increasing political power to set their own rules. And I say sphere of knowledge because it has, you know, all the contours of a machine that creates information, disseminate, disseminates it, has people act on that, trains people up in it. So they have invested in think tanks, media, educational programs, They've funded citizen groups. They've sort of got the nuts to coffee apparatus to create their own knowledge. So the point of this talk maybe, you know, James pressed me on this, is are we in what a Republican strategist called the reality-based community screwed? So kind of. 
Um, and what I want to talk about a little bit is how we got screwed and what the dangers are to 21st century American democracy and maybe urge that we don't give up, but talk about how do we frame some solutions. So I want to frame the talk. I want to begin by setting out what I see are these two spheres and two problems. We all know that ultra rich people have a huge amount of power in the marketplace where they own lots and lots of resources. They control businesses, they own land, they own property, they control a lot of real stuff. But they also have an, a tremendous amount of power in the political sphere and I will argue also in the sphere of knowledge. And it's the political sphere that we pretty much know about. This is what you hear talked about a lot. Donors put a lot of money into candidates. Those candidates are friendly to making laws that benefit them, to appointing judges that are friendly to them, and that increases their privileges and their wealth. And you have this kind of spiraling effect. I think most of us are pretty on board with that. But what I want to pay more attention to tonight is this sphere of knowledge, the way in which a tremendous amount of donation and investment has gone into shaping educational curricula, forming policy think tanks and foundations that fund public action, that feed into media to shape public opinion. And what I want to look at really is how this sphere of knowledge really is supporting this political sphere. I'm also trying to balance these two problems, which I call the problem of the concentration of power and the problem of um, alternative facts. And so the problem of the concentration of power, we could also call maybe the Richard Reich problem. To his credit, uh, the former labor secretary has been trying to ring the alarm about the growing hegemony of rich and powerful people to unseat American democracy. And I think it's really important that we start talking about the language of power. We're always talking about the the um, income or the wealth inequality. But even though we know in our heads that wealth inequality leads to a power inequality, it's important to start talking and structuring the discussion around those terms. So Reich says, don't assume that we're locked in a battle between capitalism and socialism. We already have socialism for the very rich. Today, the great divide is between democracy and oligarchy. So I think we all recognize something in that. And, and I can't mm -hmm. understate how serious I think we should take that warning. Um, we know that the American government plows lots of resources, invests lots of money into protecting and securing the wealth of a few while the common needs of the vast majority of us are neglected. Now, Wright's point is that there's not just one ideology that goes across this oligarchy, and that, in fact, the partisan divide actually benefits most of the people in, these, in this class. His solution, you know, he's written this book called, you know, how the system was rigged and how to fix it. His solution to fixing it is stop the concentration of power or restructure the, 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 the way in which power works, which I kind of find, well, great. That's a great idea. But that's, you know, the beginning. Even if we had enough leverage in the popular sphere, to convince or force people who have power to give it up. The problem is that there is an entire sphere out there which is allied to those oligarchs. And there might not be, you know, one party that goes through all these oligarchs, but there has been the very conscious and very specific creation of 
this sphere of knowledge for the right, which is separate from the sphere of knowledge that, according to them, the left has constructed. And the existence of these two spheres makes some kind of shared reality all but impossible. So that kind of brings us to the um, problem of alternative facts, which is which I've called the Hannah Arendt problem. Because the problem isn't that there's one falsehood that everybody is buying into. The problem is that there are multiple versions of the truth and a lot of confusion among the population and no one who's really going to adjudicate what's true and what's not true. And those are the conditions that Arendt said leads to a kind of authoritarian ground in which people are both vulnerable to lies, but also cynical about the truth. So they'll follow their leaders in the most outrageous claims. And if those claims are then debunked or exposed, they're very cynical about it. Well, you know, it's politics. You have to cheat the cheaters. So she says that the point of political falsehoods isn't just a substitute for truth, but to actually destroy the sense by which we take our bearings on the real world. So that an authoritarian is kind of a relief because finally you can stop trying to puzzle out things. You have someone to, who tells you what the real story and you follow that story. She wrote that the ideal person that totalitarianism is going to rise from isn't the convinced party person, isn't the person who's, you know, got convictions of their beliefs, but it's the people who can't any longer tell the difference between belief and what the basis for a belief would be, can't tell the difference between fact and fiction or true and false. So I want to look at how these, these uh, power problems work in concert with the problem of the alternative facts in these two spheres. And in fact, I mean, really most of what we believe to be true is a matter of our trust in particular processes and institutions. I believe in the atomic theory. I've never seen an atom, but I trust in the process of the scientific method. I trust the community of science not to be um, so off the mark that at least it isn't a useful approximation of reality. So it's always been the case as well that the people in the power are really instrumental in maintaining the institutions that we depend upon to create truth and in supporting the faith that people have in the processes. So that is nothing new. And in fact, at the end of the 20th century, many, many intellectuals became interested in how is it that we do verify what a fact is? How is it that information has power in this age of mass media? And that became the particular focus of many 20th century cultural scholars. One of the most famous, of course, is Noam Chomsky, who with his co-author Herman wrote Manufacturing Consent in 1988. And in that book, Chomsky and Herman maintained that the press is not a check to political power, but it's actually an organ of the establishment that limits democracy by appealing to a consumerist tendencies and by shaping public opinion. So according to Chomsky and Herman, the mainstream media is a propaganda machine, but for powerful corporations and politicians, it doesn't inform for a very critical debate, but rather it defines and limits the debate to certain topics and forecloses debate of things that are upsetting or outside that little realm. Now, in the hands of the right-leaning media that's kind of arisen in the last 50 years, this has been sort of reduced to the mainstream media lies. And meanwhile, if the, they lie, then we have to construct our own machine to tell the truth. But then, of course, they embrace the exact same strategies that Chomsky addressed, 
the power of ownership, selling audiences to advertisers, um, attacking journalists who come up with stories that are inconvenient, diverting from inconvenient facts with other stories, focusing on a common enemy, and in this case, the liberals. And they've built this huge machine from the ground up. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Powell memo. I'm really fascinated with it. Um, Don mentioned this when he spoke. Um, I'm not gonna have time to go into it too much, but I do just wanna point out that, you know, this was a, a, a memo written to the, comp, the, um, the Chamber of Commerce encouraging the businessmen to invest lots of money and lots of power and to coordinate to build, to infiltrate this system, to meet these liberals, you know, on the campuses, on the TV screen, on the lecture circuit, in the publishing houses, to start creating a, a intellectuality for the right. He really felt that the wrong people were driving the train. You know, you had you had consumer advocates like. Ralph Nader getting cars recalled. You had um, environmentalists getting environmental regulations passed. And he felt that this was an attack, as he said, on American freedom and American institutions. And he sets this up very much as a war mentality. I also think it's interesting that in the Powell memo, facts don't really matter. So it doesn't really matter if Ralph Nader found that cars were unsafe. It doesn't really matter if journalists uncovered connections between Dow's profit-making um, plans and selling napalm to the government. Um, he really sidesteps steps facts. And in fact, he had been a corporate lawyer for Big Tobacco. And to his death, he maintained that Big Tobacco should be able to discount scientific claims linking cancer and smoking. So he sort of is from this whole realm that a lot of strategies for disinformation came from um, and persist to this day in the environmental movement against the environmental movement, I should say. But also he sort of gave people who were looking for it this language of neoliberalism. That's another word that's come up. And I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about how neoliberalism provides a, a kind of shelter for a lot of anti-liberal animus and anti-liberal activism. So if I were going to use a, a slogan that is approximately correct, I'd say that neoliberalism is about limiting government and, and unlimited capitalism. The idea is that governments only true role, only legitimate role, is to support free commerce. So they can set up a justice system, military and police forces, very little else. Um, all, all other services and goods should be provided by for-profit businesses. And in that way, citizens decide what's best for themselves, according to this theory. And their freedom is expressed by their decision in the market what they produce, where they work, what they buy, where they live. So it's this idea that people are most free in this neoliberal um, situation that leads to more and more prosperity because it runs on self-interest and people have more energy when they're working for their interest, which leads to expanded market, which means more prosperity, which leads to expanding markets. So they're looking at this upward spiral of better and better conditions of life for everyone. That's sort of the way they sell it. Now, interestingly, um, Friedrich von Hayek, who was one of the architects of the theories of neoliberalism, thought that this was really a matter of knowledge. It was really a matter of knowledge. And that knowledge told you how to apportion the authority and powers that belong to government and the authority and powers that belong to people. 
He believed that only the market reveals what's best for society because it's only through the market that you can see what it is people really want or value. Governments can't, can't possibly know what everybody wants. They can't possibly realize what's good for a society. And they interfere by engineering the economy or regulating commerce. And that is actually an evil thing. And it's actually putting um, society back and freedom back. So he thought further that the welfare state, including progressive tax schemes or anything like a stimulus package, leads to a socialist totalitarianism. Now, this theory was particularly spread about in the United States by the most influential economist of the 20th century, Milton Friedman, who trained many, many people. And I won't go too far into his other ideas, except that he very tightly tried to convince people that democracy and this free market capitalism were one and the same. And you can see how this idea would appeal to businessmen that all goods and services should be run by private for-profit businesses, that taxes should be very low, that businesses should not be regulated. And of course that gets summarized in Ronald Reagan's famous pithy little saying, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. So in the hands of the people who were kind of ready to um, turn their money into power, this memo offered a, you know, this great tactical master plan. And it also gave them a kind of language, a language to express their, um, their own worldview in terms of personal freedom, not public safety, but personal freedom and concern for government overreach as opposed to protecting you know, group interests. So over the years, the people who invested in this network were able to completely turn around the concerns of 1970s so that the villains would not be the greedy corporations, but the deep state. And here are some of the um, early signers on to the program, investors, the Koch brothers, of course. Um, this is Richard Mellon Skyf. Okay. This is Joseph Coors. They were some of the first of the millionaires to start pouring money into creating this huge machine that goes from political think, think tanks, Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institution. They founded publications. They um, invested in university programs like the Mercatus Center at George Mason. They employed PhD strategists, organizers, marketing experts, media consultants, all these people to further their message. And then they began funding organizations for citizen action. They helped organize the Moral Majority and the Tea Party. They funded legislative um, uh, writing think tanks like ALEC and the judicial drafting of the Federalist Society, which of course has picked the Supreme Court justices in the last, I think it's four cases. Um, and they began to coordinate. They, they would all stay on the same page. And they do that through things like CPAC and Koch's own network. And they're able to just do this amazing amount of stuff because they have all these different lever, lev, levers at all these different levels. And a lot of that money is actually tax-free because it goes to 501c3s. So my point here though, well, the point I'm gonna drive at here is that these um, think tanks actually um, have worked to undermine disinterested scientific knowledge, especially in the social sciences, which yes, is problematic, but I think that it's gone way past just balancing the picture. The majority of funding in these think tanks actually goes to PR, actually goes to, you know, getting their message out on media platforms and having in placing um, articles in various publications. A lot of the research lacks peer review. 
So you look at it and it looks like research. It's got numbers, it's got graphs, it's got references, but you check the references and they're almost always to the other think tanks that are in this little silo. So the problem is it really undermines peer review research because it characterizes what other um, researchers do as being leftist. You know, everything's categorized as either the left or the right. And that sort of undermines the whole idea of looking for a methodology that is more scientifically based. And then, of course, once these messages do get simplified and packaged and popularized, you're looking at something that is often very far from anything we could call the truth. I thought that a really interesting case of this is the story of the death panels and the way in which the fear of death panels started to reverberate around the country and really overtook the whole discussion of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. And I won't go into all of it, but it's just kind of fascinating how, how this one little proposition was seized upon. It was actually a bill that was before Congress that was going to provide funding for end of life counseling, which was already required. It was just really putting the funding in there. And this gets seized on by politicians and finally Sarah Palin, who says that what it means is that the ACA is going to institute death panels. And within weeks, that's all over the country. Everybody knows about it. Everybody's talking about, about it. Even though it's being debunked in all the mainstream media, it's amplified on the blogs and speeches on talk shows by other politicians. It gets, it gets um, the, the think tanks don't clarify at all the, at all the issue, but rather they kind of stoke it up a bit. So you see how they're able to seize on this tiny little bit of this thousand page bill that, that touches these real hot but, button issues, like what happens when you're about to die or your mom is about to die. And they put it in the frame of government overreach. So, you know, the Cato Institute um, expert says, well, you know, the end of life decision should be consumer driven, not bureaucratically assigned. And even John Boehner is up there railing against government mandated euthanasia. So this thing kind of went crazy and showed the success of this framing of the free market and appeal to to the individual freedom above you know public health standards and characterizing the liberals as liars so they were able to beat back all the complicated discussions of it and it's just fascinating to look through this stuff how this this little thing became this little red herring becomes this huge killer whale that's threatening to you know shut down any support for the ACA at all by looking at the different registers with which all these different locations talk about it, the academic researchers, the political rhetoric, the sensationalism that some of the journalists use. And then of course, you know, Coke also, um, why isn't it going up? Oh, there we go. Um, also funds these patient rights groups to protest. And I think it also demonstrates what cognitive scientists have talked about as our biases toward false stories. And this is discussed by Daniel Kahneman, if anyone has read that. It turns out that people actually respond much more positively to a story that is partial, that doesn't have a lot of facts, that doesn't have a lot of complicating cases, that's really simple to understand. And that's especially so if the story is emotionally charged. So in fact, we're sort of constitutionally attracted to have truths and fictions. But also in this story, you can see this availability cascade. There's this availability of so many different outlets to, to multiply and increase and echo and repeat this information back and forth in so many places 
that it kicks up the importance of the story, you know, so that this tiny little thing is sort of more important than the entire Affordable Care Act. And it also kicks up the emotional charge that's attached to it. I also think it's interesting to compare that incident, <clears throat> excuse me, to the 2020 election, because you can see the same percentage of buy-in among elect uh, Republicans for both these, these cases. So um, about 50% of all Republicans believed that the ACA really was going to institute death panels and only about 30% actively disbelieved it. It's about the same number as believes that Donald Trump actually won the election. And there's also a similar kind of doubling down reaction in different registers according to academic, political, or popular platforms. So all the academic, all the think tanks are just talking about you know, voter integrity and real threats to fraud, sometimes using research that's 15 years old. I'm running out of time. I was going to talk a little bit about how conservatives have taken advantage of the changes that are happening in education and media in order to further their own message. I just met, mention a couple of things. One is the way in which laws regarding the media have changed. Um, so that we've rescinded the fairness doctrine. Um, you don't have to present a balanced view of anything. You don't have to give people a, a chance to respond. You don't have to give candidates equal time. Um, the Telecommunications Act made it possible. This is really what opened the doors to concentration of power. It allowed um, ownership of media across markets, across technologies. It allowed, you know, Rupert Murdoch had already gotten a special dispensation to already be transgressing that. Um, but you can see that where it lands us is that there are six companies that own almost any information that you are going to look at from your social media platform to the print news to broadcast to just about anything. Um, the other thing I just wanted to notice was that all this electronic media and free content has also ended in what they call ghosting the news. And that means that there is less and less actual on the ground local reporting and local reporters were responsible for breaking a lot of big scandal stories. But even in big metropolitan areas now, you don't have any real on the ground journalists working. And finally, it's just given air to people who can use that platform. And this is Dan Bongino. Dan Bongino um, was, a, you know, he was a secret service guy who worked as a White House guard and parlayed that into a book and a YouTube channel and sort of deals in this rage. And of course, now he's running for office. Um, again, I'm going to skip over a little bit of this because I think all of you are pretty um, knowledgeable about, about this, about, you know, this is sort of the, the power and politics thing, right? How incredibly immensely rich these people and how many millions and millions of dollars they put into the political process. And the point is that, you know, okay, so so Michael Bloomberg can afford to spend $153 million on political contributions. Just think how many people that represents who would have to, you'd have to get together to get that much money. Um, and, you know, these people have more money than whole countries, than a lot of whole countries. Um, and obviously they've been able to pass just an incredible number of laws that are very beneficial to them. And one of the most important things, of course, was Citizens United, um, which was a case that was largely bankrolled, you know, the, the litigation of it largely bankrolled by this cadre of um, conservative guys who own these networks and allows unlimited spending in PACs, the Political Action Committee. Um, and the thing is about these pacts, you can say literally almost anything. So you remember the swift boat veterans for truth who smeared Kerry's war record 
and the 2004 campaign. Well, in the 2004 campaign, there was only $301 million of PAC money in circulation. In the last cycle, there was $5.2 billion used for PACs. Some of you might have gotten the phone call suggesting that Joe Biden was going to pay for sex changes for second graders. Um, they can say almost anything. So the, the, the result is that we have rich donors on both sides, but increasingly elections are about being fueled by that money and also by party money. And it's almost all coming out of the district or the state that's being represented. So the only thing being represented is the party. And that makes sense of why gerrymandering is becoming such an incredibly huge struggle. Also, because it kind of separates everything into part, two parties, the parties brand the problems and they brand the solutions. And that's going to cut out so many inconvenient facts. It's going to cut out so many solutions. It's going to make finding solutions very, very difficult. So here's the thing. I have been feeling very much like we are living in a hall of mirrors. And an example of this is the whole, the whole um, election steal um, kerfuffle. Um, the, the Democratic managers labeled Donald Trump's incitement and, and accusation that the election had been stolen from him from a phrase in Mein Kampf. Um, Hitler had suggested that um, the common perception that World War I had been lost in large part to a particular commander. He said that that was a lie, that actually that lie had been spread by the Jews to deflect the blame from themselves but that everybody believed it was the commander because it was such a big lie, no one would think anybody would lie that big. But of course the irony is that it was Hitler's big lie and he got away with it because it was such a huge lie. So they were trying to brand Trump with this idea of the big lie, you know, that he said, oh, well, the election was a big lie and it's such a big lie that so many people believed him because why would he lie about something so big? But then, of course, Trump himself turned that around and said, no, the big liars were the Democrats saying he was the big liar. So you get this, this sort of back and forth between um, people calling each other liars. You know, I'm rubber, you're glue. You're a liar. No, you're a liar. You're gaslighting me. No, you're gaslighting me. And it goes on and on. Tucker Carlson is excellent at doing this. He does that and he's always telling his audience that he's the one who's giving them the truth, that the liberal media lies to him, but he's got, he's got truth on the side and he's going to save the world for democracy. And in that process, in that sort of hall of mirrors process, what happens is that what the truth that emerges is, is really just your opinion. The truth is your opinion. And you can see that really, really well in this defense of Sidney Powell, who is engaged in this um, suit um, that's been taken out against her by Dominion voting machines because she spread the claim that Dominion voting machines was in cahoots with Venezuelan communists to overthrow Trump's election win. Now, her defense is that that's what she believes and she's that's her opinion and if her opinion is that this is a true claim then she has the right to claim it and that sort of elision between that's my opinion and that's true is exactly what's at the heart of so much of this and Hannah Arendt again was right on the money warning us about this. She saw in America that the protection of free speech, of having opposing views could quickly turn into the right to have opposing facts. And when that happened, all hell would break loose. And I almost feel like we've come full circle when you see an elected member of the Congress 
who's struggling to admit that the Holocaust happened. So, um, you know, we're kind of screwed. There's been um, democratic strategists who said, well, why aren't we pinning this on Trump and the Republicans, this attachment to this lie? Why aren't this insurrection, this lie, why aren't we going forward with it? There is no infrastructure. There is no machine to create that message that's separate from the machine that the right has created. Um, and this is a quote from Karl Rove. You are in what we call the reality-based community, people who believe, well, it's attributed to Karl Rove. You believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. But that's not the world, the way the world works anymore. We're an empire now. And when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. So it, it just the confidence in one's ability to control resources through controlling people and to control people through controlling resources through the magic of a good story is just astounding. So maybe we're kind of screwed, but you know, certainly both democracies and free markets are both kind of aspirational fictions themselves. And the danger to both of them is a concentration of power. So the thing is that when both of these ideas were being theorized, American democracy and free market capitalism, the safeguards that were imagined in the 18th century just do not hold anymore. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, obviously the 18th century safeguards for um, keeping us safe from factional violence and demagoguery, um, and you know, if they ever really worked, um, just can't hold today. So for example, the Electoral College was supposed to keep us from pure demagoguery by electing human voters who could provide some kind of reasoned debate. Um, the Electoral College, you know, is now up to popular vote, but also the focus of party gamemanship. Um, local support for candidates to support them was supposed to sort of keep in check people who had a lot of power in a particular area. And even if they had a lot of power in their particular area, they would still represent their area and be balanced when they came together with other leaders in the federal Congress. But of course now, big money and party money is really the most important factor. So you can sort of go down all these things and see how they really don't hold anymore. So we're really getting to be out of time. So I'm just putting this up here. Uh, this isn't, this is, this is sort of the, um, in the middle of the night, where can we go from here list, you know, list of stuff that might be, there are many, many other paradigms out there. There are many other um, economic paradigms that aren't getting too much air right now um, that could be used. There's a lot of good ideas out there, but how do we coordinate them? How do we mobilize them? There are a lot of questions to be asked and you'll notice I did put like question marks at most of these the only ones that have periods are that we need to practice democracy and obviously you know most of you are incredibly active in trying to protect the national and and local forms of political democracy but I also mean as James has mentioned that we need to build the local practices and institutions of democracy. Voluntary organizations are one of the few places where people actually get to exercise democracy. And the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg is one of the few institutions I've ever belonged to that really is democratic, or at least as close as I've ever experienced. And the other one is have faith, because if we allow ourselves to get too cynical and just stop, then the whole game's up. So we need to find our way back to reality. And it's gonna be a challenge because even 
any kind of nation state sovereignty is being challenged right now in context of the international trade, environmental collapse, the challenges of migration and refugees, all nation states are being stressed. And they're also all being stressed by these internal struggles between forces that really want to keep at bay those changes. So those at least are real problems. And it's the challenge to sort of find a way or to push along a system that's going to figure out the power of the problem of power. And I suppose my inclination is to suggest that we need to start with looking at this problem of information, the problem of that knowledge sphere. <laughs>